thank you very much, John. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, I hope you're enjoying the conference so far. Um, I'd like to thank Scottish Borders Council, particularly, um, especially Keith Elliott, for inviting me to talk to you today. Um, so my name's Andrew Jepson, and I am Archaeology Scotland's Stobbs Camp Project Officer. Um, I'm delighted to be starting this afternoon's session with a talk about art and creativity at Stobbs Camp. And we'll come on to a little bit about what Stobbs actually was before I go into the talk proper. But it, it kind of struck me recently how some elements of First World War internment and our current lockdown are quite similar. How the effects of our pandemic today resonate with what it was to be a prisoner of war over 100 years ago. And, and by that, I mean how we both have had to live through a worldwide crisis, um, how we, we did not know when that crisis would end, how we've had to accept restrictions on our freedoms, for example, limits on our movement and not seeing friends and loved ones. And of course, the impact lockdown and internment has on our mental health. So today I'd like to explore how the German internees faced the challenges before them, how they clung on to a sense of normality in a world that was far from normal. And perhaps today we can look back and be inspired by their resolve, their ambition and the creativity from this barbed wire world. So in this short talk, I'm going to focus on some key aspects of internee art and creativity. But first, obviously, I'd like to set the scene, um, give you a brief introduction to Stobbs, the content of which forms part of a, a longer talk on the history of the camp and the work that we've been doing there. So this is Stobbs, just four miles from the town of Hoyk in the Scottish borders. It is internationally important as it relates to Scotland's preparation for the First World War and the subsequent handling of First World War prisoners. Um, you may just be able to make out, if I show my cursor, the extent of the POW camp, which runs along this section here, around here and back again. So that's the extent of the POW camp, but you can see a wider landscape of a military site. In 1902, with a, a country reeling from the Boer War, the War Department bought approximately five and a half square miles of the Stobbs estate for the purposes of training British soldiers. In the year following the acquisition, the first regiments began arriving by the late summer, and by 1903, almost 20,000 soldiers had trained at Stobbs. One exercise alone is believed to have involved 11,000 men, and you may just make out the King's Own Scottish borders in the picture there. The training season ran from around April until October, but it was occupied by administrative staff all the year round. During the decade before the First World War, British soldiers were accommodated under canvas, as you can see here. When war was declared in August 1914, two things happened. Firstly, the amount of British soldiers training at Stobbs increased rapidly. And secondly, it also became the headquarters for all the POW camps in Scotland and an internment camp itself, holding initially German civilians and then military and naval prisoners. Construction then went into overdrive. Over 150 buildings were erected, including 80 barrack huts, of which you can see here, surrounded by heavy triple barbed wire fencing. There were many additional buildings, including cookhouses, bathhouses, post offices, laundries and ablutions blocks. There were exercise yards and a hospital with six ward huts, an operating theatre and a mortuary. The first civilian internees arrived in November 1914 and the first military prisoners in early 1915. Fearing that they would perhaps be influenced, the authorities kept the civilians in camps A and B, away from the military prisoners in camps C and D. And we have a report in April 1916 that states that there were 2,269 civilians and 2,323 soldiers and sailors at Stobbs. The majority of these four and a half thousand plus prisoners were German, 
although there were some Austrians and one or two Turks. And today we can still see the foundations of many buildings across the site. Um, but there are still upstanding buildings too, including this structure that I have circled. This is our last remaining barrack hut inside the POW camp. One of 80 huts holding up to 50 prisoners at any one time. But let us now return to the, the task in hand, how the internees kept themselves occupied, and more importantly, motivated. What was important to the prisoners was the continuation of their education. Although this probably grew out of a sense of duty to the fatherland and a future prosperous Germany, it also kept their minds active during their time in captivity. And here you can see a, a picture of a, a, a camp library. And the library included many hundreds of donated books on German history and classics and geography. But there were also many volumes on mathematics, economics, construction, art, philosophy, English and French. And you can see by the, the, the quantity of books in this picture that the, it was quite established. But the prisoners also established a camp school and a, a programme of evening lectures. Lessons were taught by fellow prisoners who had a, a background in teaching. Here in German is a timetable produced in January 1917 of classes. And they include classes on a wide range of subjects, including, uh, and this is a long list, German, arithmetic, calligraphy, bookkeeping, physics, history, cultivation, taxation, business principles, advertising, law and banking, many, many subjects. And we know in 1917 camps A and B had 41 teachers and over 2000 students. And in camps C and D, they had 26 teachers and over 1,500 students. So very popular indeed. Now, despite the large number of images we have of Stobbs, we have very few that show what it was like inside a hut, but this is one of those. Um, you may see the board at the front here. Bauschula is the construction school. You may just be able to make out the calipers on the board at the front here and architectural drawings on the back wall, just at the back there. Clubs were also very popular at Stobbs. There were clubs for gymnastics, sports, drama, music and chess. But there was also book printing, gardening and mountaineering. The internees also practiced a variety of handicrafts. Many were proficient craftsmen, making furniture, picture frames and a variety of objects they could sell to the guards and locals to earn money. And here, courtesy of the Imperial War Museum, is a Werkstatt, a workshop where Stubbs prisoners can be seen making ornamental wooden boxes, just here, and what look like chessboards. Wooden toys with articulated limbs were popular too as were toys generally. This collection was acquired by a British clerk at Stobbs during the First World War. Objects like these would probably have been made from emptied packing crates. So if supplies come into the camp once they've been used, the crates can then be used for, for making art. And here we have a, a marquetry panel made by a Stobbs prisoner in 1915. Marquetry is a, it's an artistic form using inlaid pieces of wood, bone or tortoise shell to form patterns or pictures. This wooden panel shows a Dutch scene with uh, a boat, if I just point this out there, figures wearing clogs here and here, and then just very small in the background there, there's a windmill. Now, the most exciting discovery was made when other panels from Stobbs came to light using the same design. Here, inscribed on the back, made by prisoner of war at Stobbs encampment 1916. And here, POW Stobbs 1917. Remarkably, the same design from three different years. So clearly these objects are not one-off items made by an individual prisoner passing some time. Rather, they suggest a production line supplying a demand.
And these beautiful pieces of art are cow bones, carved with such exquisite skill. But they demonstrate how the internees made use of what they had available to them. Once the meat had been consumed, the bones then became a canvas for art. If that earns you money, then that's a real bonus as well. Effectively, cow bones became camp currency between the internees and guards. Now, these carvings, if you if you may be able to read some of the letters, um, are from the Isle of Man. But this pastime was common across a number of First World War internment camps. And we know that the YMCA helped to sell the carvings, but ironically later complained that they were being produced quicker than they could sell them. A third area of study is the internee newspaper, Stobziada, meaning news from Stobbs. This was distributed around the camp and sent to friends and family back home. This is the first edition produced in September 1915. It begins with a short poem to introduce the new publication to its audience. And I'll read this poem to you now. On you go then, little Stobziada, as the first issue into the field. We hope that you will find mercy in our wire bound world. Be the true mirror of our life, framed by golden humour, so that we do not notice the locks and bolts, nor the sentry in front of the gate. In your columns, however, no politics will have a place, though every spirit will prevail, which tingles and sparkles and roars and bubbles. Stobziada, may your life be short. Let's hope the captive army will soon make its way home. Yes, very soon, say goodbye to Stobbs. Now, ironically, this was produced in 1915 and the paper was was still being printed in 1919. So it was quite a while they had to wait. So as I say, the civilian internees started the newspaper in 1915 and they produced 14 editions. It was printed in Hoyk. After the civilians transferred to the Isle of Man, the military prisoners took over production and they published a further 25 editions. The last one was dated January, February 1919. Each edition usually had a print run of 4,000 um, and was scrutinised by a censor in case it contained sensitive information. Only one edition was rejected. That, of course, is the edition we don't have. Stubbs Yarder offers a wonderful insight into daily camp life and, as, and is invaluable to us as a resource. From articles, poems and local news to competitions, letters and sporting events, it brought their resolve into focus. I should also say that it is also littered with sarcasm and black humour. On the back page, the internees advertise their services. We have, and I shall highlight this, H. Schlotterman in Hut 9. He provides a laundry service. Delicate fabrics will be starched and ironed, careful handling, reasonable prices. And here in the hairdressing section, we have Otto Watzlaff, just here, in Hut 40. He's a hair specialist who provides, and I quote, treatment of hair loss with electricity and self-made medical hair tonic. Success is guaranteed. He also provides a razor sharpening service. And later on in, the, in the, this page, with tongue firmly in cheek, we have an offer of marriage. Tired of being alone, a retired cavalry captain, still in passably good condition, longs for bonds of marriage, preferably golden ones. Unattached musical ladies with cash and somewhere to stay will be preferred. Send for further information to High Pressure 80 at the Stobbs Post Office. For entertainment, the internees also staged their own theatre productions and camp, uh, concerts in camp. And here we have a printed programme from Weihnacht, Christmas 1915. Here you can see an image from a production of Die Frankfurter, The Man from Frankfurt. The drama groups had their own costumes, as you can see, and makeup and sets. And of course, the productions would take place in one of the huts. The more observant of you will notice that there are at least three prisoners playing female roles. One there, 
second one there, third one there, and possibly a fourth at the back. Music was an integral part of many of the theatre productions. There exist a considerable number of programmes which include musical interludes. We also have programmes detailing entire musical concerts, and some tell us the names of those musicians. We know that professional musicians were given instruments by the YMCA, and a 13-piece camp orchestra was formed, which was said to be the equal of the best guards band in London. The range of musical scores played by the orchestra indicate the competence of these musicians. Wagner, Haydn, Mendelssohn, Strauss and Offenbach feature regularly. Bands were also called upon to play music at camp funerals. But I'd like to conclude this short talk um, by showing this wonderful image of a theatrical group with you. Um, and I'd like to point a few things out. When we compare the impact of First World War internment and our 21st century pandemic, as I say, we can see some many similarities. There's a seemingly unending crisis. There's restriction, regulation, and perhaps an overwhelming sense of desperation. The impact on our mental health is unavoidable. But look at the faces in this image. In this moment in time, adversity is a million miles away. Hair, makeup, costumes and musical instruments and smiling faces. And that's saying nothing about the gentleman here with a top hat being squeezed into a corset. We can, I hope, be inspired by the prisoners at Stobbs behind the barbed wire through their desire to learn, their humour, their handicrafts, theatrics and music, we should perhaps acknowledge their spirit. As we learnt from Stubbs Yarder, this is a spirit which tingles and sparkles and roars and bubbles. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>